very advanced. Okay, um, it's a small group, but I, I, I thought of more and more people who expect it, but it's fine, we can start in, and, uh, and um, if you have questions, just ask me, yeah? So, my name is uh, Roel uh, Ophoff. Can everybody see it? Because it's kind of low, isn't it? Can, can, can you see it? Uh, don't, feel, don't be shy, you can also move forward if you need to. Um, so my name is uh, Roel Ophoff. I'm a, I'm a human geneticist, and, but I'm uh, appointed um, uh, at the Semmel Institute, which is the Department of Psychiatry. So uh, as a human geneticist, we study mental illness. One of the things is that I thought about is this, that you are in the Bruins in Genomics program, and, um, and for you to answer the question, why would you even bother about genomics when studying mental illness? Uh, as one of the questions that you can ask or try to answer for yourself. Maybe you can answer that at the end. Um, when I did my PhD some time ago, genomics was not a term that we used at all. It was just genetics. And uh, so when you think about the definition of genetics and genomics, the difference between that is, as far as I would say, it's m not merely because it's quite different. It's merely uh, a scale. The genome is... Uh, uh, all of it, and a gene is a single locus or a single, a single location or a single variant. So it's really the scale difference that has taken place in the last few years, and you will see that also in what I present today. So we will talk about um, psychiatric illnesses and its application in, in, in genomics. And what I will do is we have some introductory words. We talk about the illnesses itself, and then um, some studies that are ongoing as illustrations and also see where the field is, and then two applications that are taking place in my, in my group um, as alternative approaches to do genomic approaches to study uh, a mental illness, and at the end we can have some discussion if necessary or uh, some concluding remarks. So as a geneticist itself, um, I, always, I mostly start with this type of overview because Whatever we do as geneticists, we try to link a phenotype, an observation, with a genotype. So there's genetic variation and there is uh, a trait measure, whatever it is. Could it be disease, could be uh, behavior, could be anything, could be height. Um, and we try to link those two together. Is there a connection between the genetic variation and, and, and the outcome of, your, of the trait measure? And that by itself is, is very simple. That principle is very simple. And, and so when I, whenever I think about human genetics and its application, uh, I go back to this concept, uh, which is um, simple, even though the working out of it is f oftentimes far more complex. If you then consider the phenotype, and remember, if we were not able to define a phenotype, the whole mission of studying mental illness would be a lost cause. We need to be able to, to define what it is. Otherwise, what are you studying? You're not even able to define it. Um, but the burden, it's clear, whatever mental illness you, how you describe it, how you consider it, the burden of mental illness to society is enormous, is enormous. It's uh, based on this particular slide, um, it's equal to non-communicable diseases as, as cardiovascular cancer and others. Uh, mental illness is oftentimes not spoken about. Um, it also involves, as, used there, as listed there, uh, drug abuse, and it's recently in, in the news quite a bit, um, something that's ravaging many uh, cities in the United States. But the impact it has on lives and economic impact, social impact, is, 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 is huge. We consider schizophrenia, which is an, a very, quite an extreme phenotype in the spectrum of mental illness. It's still, you can find it at 1% of the population, roughly speaking, of adults. And that means that you, you know more than 100 people each. That means that very likely in your life or in your surroundings, one or two steps removed maybe, uh, uh, you, there is a patient with schizophrenia, the, the diagnosis. And so even though it's rare, relatively speaking, at, as a whole and especially as a nation, you will find many patients, it affects many people. And of course, as soon as there's a patient, there's also a family impacted by it and other relationships as well. When you consider the phenotype itself, um, I always try to put it, set aside three different levels. There's positive symptoms, there's negative symptoms, and cognitive symptoms. The cognitive symptoms are mostly chronic, so they stay and become worse over time. And so a cognitive decline, less active, um, or less be being less able to memorize things or organize things, really impacts how you function in society. But the positive and the negative symptoms come and go. 
positive symptoms such as hallucinations. You see things that are not, ought not to be there or you hear things. The negative symptoms are mostly yeah, your lack of pleasure in life and uh, um, um, lack of initiative is listed here as well. So those three things, positive, negative, and cognitive symptoms, make up uh, schizophrenia. It's clear. Yeah. A po you can say this, the positive symptom means something is there that ought not, not to be there. A negative is that there's something not there that ought to be there. Okay. Yeah? Okay. But none of these symptoms, by the way, is visible on the outside, except some, when someone is, uh, has a psychosis and yelling and screaming. But otherwise, there's no biological marker that says so who, who is ill or not. And when you go back in the history, human history, and say, okay, 5,000 years of recorded history in humans, there's only a hundred or so that we really have in which psych psychiatric illness has been more properly described and carefully described. And for some reason, there were particularly the Germans and the Swiss that did, did it well. And, and Kreplian was one of those who first made a distinction between schizophrenia and bipolar. It was only uh, roughly a hundred years ago, not, not that long ago. And he called schizophrenia dementia precox. And dementia uh, goes back to the cognitive decline. In today's world, interestingly, it's especially the psychosis that is carrying the phenotype uh, more than the cognitive decline. So when patients are identified and characterized, uh, psychosis is one of the first characteristics that are, are being used, is being used. While in the initial stages of, of describing psychiatry or s illnesses, it was the cognitive uh, component. So you see a change over time there. The term itself was also rather new and it was coined soon after that. And at the same time, it was observed that the disease occurred more frequently in, in families. So if you have a patient, a first degree relative was more often affected as well. Genetics is involved. So it all happened some hundred years ago. Today we, have, we know that there is a spectrum of diseases. Huh? There is schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. We can separate those two to some extent, but there's also, a, I'm not sure you can read it from there, but schizoaffective disorder. And that's really something in between bipolar and schizophrenia. It, it is, it's even possible that some patients will be diagnosed with one when they're younger and later in life with another mental illness um, uh, because the symptoms change slightly and the diagnostic criteria are don't, were not fulfilled earlier on, but later they were. So it is, it is sometimes a little bit fluid where patients are in the spectrum, even though a full-blown um, schizophrenia patient is different from a full-blown bipolar, severe bipolar disorder patient. In this list, you can also see the age of onset. For schizophrenia, it's 16 to 30, but for autism, it's really, really young. Um, bipolar is sometimes, oftentimes a little later in life. Um, I said heritability, or g g genetics is involved. And if you consider the literature and look at the twin family-based studies in which you can establish how much of the variation of the disease is due to genetic variation, uh, you can see that, for example, for schizophrenia over here, it's almost 80% heritable. Tourette's syndrome is also highly heritable. But for major depression here, it is somewhat less, still 30% or so. Huh? So for all of these major psychiatric disorders, there's clear indication of a heritable component to the disease which is an important thing. If, if, if there's no heritability of a, of a trade measure, why would you even bother studying it genetically? Hmm? That's one thing. But the other is, even though there is a huge um, uh, stigma against a psychiatric illness in society, it is clear that biology is extremely important. For schizophrenia, you can say 1% general population. But what is the risk that a relative of, so of a patient also develops uh, schizophrenia. And let's go straight to the bottom. An identical twin, genetically identical. It's roughly 50% that the other twin member also develops uh, uh, schizophrenia in this case. So 50%, so that's really genetic. But you can also flip side the same coin and say, well, that means that 50% is not afflicted by the same disease. You could have some other type of mental illness that's not included in the analysis here. But for the schizophrenia as such, it's clear that there are other factors than genetics that determine the disease too. Otherwise, the identical twins would be closer to 100%. Yeah? So genetics plays a role, but clearly also non-genetic factors. Important to remember. So putting this together, the current design of the, or the current idea of the 
how the disease arises is really over time. And when you, this is a timeline here, this is birth. Yeah? This is the model, it mean, doesn't mean it's true, it, it's a hypothesis as, as it is. And there are en environmental factors and genetic factors that even occur prenatally, before you're born, and give you the susceptibility to develop later when you're 20 years or 18 years, the disease itself. Yeah? And there are different, different processes that take place postnatally here that could be involved, we don't know. But it's clear that the point, the reason that I like this slide is that it shows that the, even prenatally there is determination to some extent, even though it's not 100% predictable what's going on later in life, of course. But the genetic factors play an early role in your susceptibility to the disease. And thinking about genetic factors, and you may have seen this slide before, it's overly used. There's always, always two factors in, in genetics when, when you think about genetic variants. There's how often is the genetic variance present in the population? The allele frequency, is it common or is it rare? And the other is, if you, if you have the variant, what is the likelihood for you to develop the trait or the disease? So that's the, the, um, the effect size. Because if, if it has no effect size, uh, it's just one, yeah, then why bother? Huh? But if there's an increased risk for you once you have the variant, it tells you something about a biology and a mechanism. So there are common variants, there are rare variants, and uh, the, the variants could have a low impact or high impact on, on you getting the disease. And for the rare variants uh, that have high impact, you end up with a few families out there that have the variant, and everybody who has the variant in the family has the disease. So you end up with a Mendelian trait, a monogenic trait. But that's not true for schizophrenia. 10 years ago or 15 years ago, most of the studies in the field were still assuming an, an, uh, the idea or uh, assuming uh, more like a Mendelian inheritance for diseases of schizophrenia bipolar. Major alleles were expected, but it never panned out, never panned out. And so it is really abandoned now, the uh, whole idea that rare variants contribute to the disease to an extent that what we see for Mendelian traits. So we're really more in this corner of the field where common alleles that you and I can carry, but, but we don't develop the disease. Common alleles contribute to the, to the susceptibility. And we'll also show that you, uh, some details later. Yeah? So that, that's a spectrum, um, both not just both, but for more than schizophrenia, also for bipolar, major depression, and all the other uh, complex traits uh, in psychiatry. But I'll show you later that these alleles are not, the common alleles are hard to identify. If you have a group of 100 people, 100 patients, 100 controls, you'll never be able to successful. So you really need large data sets. So 10 years ago, roughly 2007, we came together for the first time uh, as a schizophrenia uh, study group uh, to combine the data that we had because we, we received funding for testing a thousand patients here, a thousand there, but none of us were successful. We tested the genome, but, but the, most, the best technology available, and we tested all these variants, but none of them were significant. None of them were showed uh, an association with the disease. So we realized we don't have enough power to detect anything. So we got together, and the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium is really the, the, the gateway, not just now for schizophrenia, but for all the other traits as well. And so it, it includes now more than 800 investigators and uh, maybe now a million uh, subjects, uh, patients that is, of, and controls for the genetic studies of the whole spectrum of psychiatric illness. It's not a single, plat it's a single platform, but a different work groups, working groups, it, each of them study the different diseases. As listed in this uh, table from a, a bioarchives paper. So these are different groups in the PGC, and you can see, okay, the number of cases for schizophrenia is more than 60,000 today, yeah? 60,000 patients. And for bipolar, we are roughly 20,000 or 25,000. For major depression, we are more than 100,000. You can see the list here, and uh, Tourette is 4,000, and uh, PTSD is only 3.7 thousand. It also shows here that what are the number of hits thus far in these genome-wide efforts, the combined efforts? Are the number of cases in like, the United States or like the 38 countries? The worldwide. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. But there is a bias. We, we won't talk about it today, but there's a bias in the type of populations that are included. Any suggestion what kind of bias I'm talking about? 
Well, it's, it's indeed the countries that are involved. It's mainly European ancestry samples that are being studied today. There's really a push now to include Asian samples and so forth, and African American or African samples, um, um, but that's still um, um, lagging behind. Um, but you can see here the number of hits in the genome that are known to be involved in the disease based on the studies. Schizophrenia is really the poster child, a poster example here of of, of good studies that are very productive. You can see that for many it's only a handful still. It also shows you the twin heritability based on the twin studies and here for schizophrenia is roughly 81%. We talked about it before. And you can ask the question how much of the common variants that are being assayed today in these large studies, um, how much of the heritability is explained? And you can see that for schizophrenia we are well ahead. It's, it's a good number even though we're not we are not fully there, uh, there at the 81%, but it's, it's really getting there. For others, it is more a rough estimate where we are and more work is needed to move forward. And here at the end, the last column, it shows you the strongest genetic correlation because the, the genome-wide efforts that are taking place and the identification of variants is nice, but there are also a lot of tools now developed, bioinformatic tools that you may be applying in your labs today or tomorrow, wherever you are in which you can do, uh, establish the correlation between traits. You have the findings of one trait and another trait. Is a risk allele for schizophrenia also a risk allele for bipolar or for major depression? And you go, when you go through the genome, you can establish genome-wide if there really is a strong correlation or not. And indeed, this correlation between schizophrenia and bipolar is 70% or so, genetic correlation. is huge. And it shows you that for each of these traits, um, the, 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 the highest correlations are listed here. Substance abuse, is it smoking, and so forth. So there's a lot of, it's not just discovery of sites in the genome that may be relevant, but also insightful how trades are genetically correlated. And when they're genetically correlated, it means the bi underlying biology is linked, is, is connected. Huh? And remember that 100 years ago, there was a separation between bipolar and schizophrenia because they represent different phenotypes but the genetic evidence here shows that they're still highly, highly connected, highly correlated. We just submitted a paper as a group, um, uh, part of the PGC, in which we studied schizophrenia and bipolar combined. We took the data and said, well, if we consider them a single disease, or if we consider the cases schizophrenia and the controls bipolar, if we contrast those, what do we find? And so it is really the early stages uh, but one of the things that we also did is, well, if we establish the risk for bipolar here, and there the risk for schizophrenia, as represented by all these common variants in the genome. And then we look at the, not just the case control status, but we consider um, psychosis in bipolar. Or we, psycho we, uh, we look at the negative symptoms in schizophrenia, or here the manic symptoms in schizophrenia. And we, so we have a list of some 20 or so of these uh, endophenotypes that are measures within the diagnosis itself. And these three that I mentioned here show high correlation, in this case psychosis is highly correlated with the schizophrenia risk as well as with bipolar risk. But the manic symptoms in schizophrenia patients is not correlated at all with schizophrenia risk, positive or negative, but it is correlated to bipolar risk. So you see that you can explain here or you can decipher here how these symptoms may, um, may, tie, may be tied to genetic risk for one disease or another. And uh, not that we suddenly know how it works, <laughs> but it is one step toward a refinement of the phenotype and a better understanding of the details, not just a category. These categories are messy for mental illness. So, and back to the other paper of PGC, looking into the future, just seeing where we are. And for the genome-wide analyses, we are working together and it works it's like an old, old machine and whenever people have new samples, they are poured in and reanalyzed. And so the sample sizes are increasing, increasing, increasing. This is the number of samples that are included in the study. And for each increase, you can just even predict how many new loci in a genome can be discovered, how many new genes and, and variants that are linked to the disease. So schizophrenia is well underway. This, by the way, is height. So human height, adult height, is genetically behaving very similar to schizophrenia. Uh, 
the architecture, not the same loci, but it is the architecture of the trade. We would, we would, who would have, that have predicted a few, a few years ago? But it is interesting. Bipolar is somewhere here still. We have still much smaller sample sizes, uh, but it is also predicted to behave well. If you then do, uh, let's say, a five-year prediction, so well, we will get 100,000, and those things are on the way. We will have 100,000 schizophrenia patients uh, by the end of next year. And for bipolar, it will go slower. It's harder to collect new samples, but it will happen too. At some point in time, there's saturation eh, in the genetic signal. 45% uh, percent of the heritability explained now. Well, at some point, it may be 80%, and getting to the 100 will be really, really difficult. You have to get so many more samples to, to get more, more um, uh, returns in terms of genetic findings. So I, I wonder where we will be when we say it's good enough. What will you say? What, what, when is it good enough? Because even here, let's say schizophrenia, more than 140 loci have been identified. Why bother? Why don't you continue? Why? Is, is more always better? What would you think? I would, I would give you a similar answer, but people may then say uh, genes that are more important. Genes that are really important are the first one to discover, isn't it? Is that true? Which genes do you discover first? Exactly, very good, Ex excellent. So it's really the genes that have the largest effect size that you will first discover, the, the sites in the genome. And um, are those the most important genes? Well, depends on you, what you call the importance. But what is the ultimate goal? Okay, understanding biology and enjoying science, yeah, that's part of it too. But there's another, another reason why we do this. Why we, we all put it always in grand writings when we say why we do this. Uh, yeah, so identify better treatment for, for patients in the future. And so, um, even though I will, I'm, I'm not a drug discoverer, I probably will never be involved in that process. Uh, it's not my expertise. Uh, it's, it is the overall purpose to identify biology that is relevant for treatment. And then it's the question, which genes or which discoveries are best and uh, most important for drug discoveries? Yeah, we don't know. And so it may be that even the gene that is discovered here may be the most accessible and best um, targetable um, item in the genome, and while it is only a minor contributor overall, when you think about genetic contribution, it may be in terms of biology and affecting the well-being of patients, it may be critically important. Huh? So th those are different things, and people will argue uh, for and against this type of studies and say it's just a, a, a money down the drain, uh, a, little more, a little more of nothing there. Uh, but then you have to think, what is the purpose? What is the goal? And are we wanna go back, do we want to go back to the early days of candidate gene approaches that, that always failed? Of course not. Okay, that's a different topic, but let's move on here. So a few years ago, we had this study, and it's probably one of the better ones, in which we, as a group, as a, as a consortium, identified these many sites in the genome. Yeah? And I think this is really, this is the overall result. We call this a Manhattan plot, and this, these are the different chromosomes, and on all these million spots on the genome, we, have, we did an analysis, and each of these dots is the result of that analysis. This bar is the genome-wide significance level. It's really it's 10 to the minus eight, five times 10 to the minus eight, and everything above there is indicated here in green. And so you can clearly see a few things here, that some things are really significant, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 27, so this is the y-axis there, really significant. But there's also, there are many, many sites in the genome. And we call this polygenicity. Yeah? A disease such as schizophrenia is highly polygenic. It's not a single locus, but many that contribute together. And that's the reason why we call it the Manhattan plot. Uh, 
because there are many buildings in Manhattan that are tall and visible from a distance. Yeah? Another observation, by the way, is this, that this type of study only assays or targets common alleles. Rare alleles are harder to, ask, to find uh, and to, for statistics to get enough power, you need bigger sample sizes. But here it's 1% or more in, in the population that we assayed, yeah, that we tested. And here to impress you, and um, this is an example of common alleles, small effect sizes, highly significant. At the bottom here is a locus on chromosome 3. The allele frequency in controls is 15.6%. 15.6. In the cases, it's 16.9. Uh, to give you an, an idea what we're, what we're talking about, it's not so that patients have it and controls don't. It's a slight increase in cases, and you're only being able to detect it, to detect it because you have these large sample sizes available for your analyses. So the odds ratio here is 1.1, meaning that if you have this allele, and you and I may have this allele, meaning that we, instead of a 1% ch uh, ch um, uh, chance of developing the disease, we have a 1.1% chance of uh, developing the disease yeah? uh, overall. So I'm, I'm not losing any sleep on this, having, I'm, I haven't tested my genome for this, but uh, I carry some of these alleles too. Yeah? So it also shows that it's not a single allele that, contrib that, that ends up you causing you the disease, but it's the, the combination of many alleles, and it goes back to the word polygenic. Yeah. Many, many. But it's highly significant. That's true. But the individual contribution of the allele in terms of genetic risk is tiny. And yet, it may be critically important for biology. If you then say, okay, l we look at the cumulative burden of common risk alleles, not just at one, but we look at a thousand or five thousand. These are different numbers of uh, thresholds that we use. In the early studies, we could only explain a few percent of the variants of the disease. Then, a few years later, we did a better job at increased sample sizes. And you can see that here, there's all some sort of a diminishing return. Even though the sample sizes are quite larger here, it's not, as, it's not the same increase observed as observed here. And, um, but it, is, it shows that the, um, when you have an increased samples, and you look at the cumulative burden of common risk alleles, that you're better able to explain the variance observed in your, in your case control uh, uh, setting. And if you project it into the future, that if you have an even better predictor, it might be useful in a clinic too at some point in time. But here, it's, it may be helpful for a physician to have this si sort of insight, but it's absolutely not a yes or no insight that is uh, uh, important for a diagnosis. I'm not sure where, so where it will be in, in five years, but I expect that genetics will play some role in a diagnosis. So we're, we're making headways there. Um, but the other thing that's important, and uh, before we sh uh, show you two examples of our own uh, work in, in, uh, in the lab, is this. You can take the, the genetic findings of the whole genome and ask the question, what kind of function does it represent? Uh, polygenicity means it's everywhere in the genome, but doesn't mean it's everywhere biologically speaking. Yeah? Still, what we know about pathways, it is not a clear picture that is emerging. But when you consider known functional domains in the genome and where they have their function, and what type of cell type, and what process, it is as shown here, we can take the, with the heritable components and ask the question, where in the functional categories that we know is most of the heritability explained? It goes back to the central nervous system. Okay. So, of course, you expect that for schizophrenia, but it's nice to see that the genetics also point back to what you expect in this case. The central nervous system is big. Uh, it, 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 it covers lots of different cell types and processes. But at least it's an important observation. There is what we need to, to look for function in biology and study it in more detail, um, and, and not in the liver or in the kidney. Yeah? And when you go into more detail there, you can even point to that the most of the evidence is found in fetal brain. And remember what I showed you before, the processes that people think are important for schizophrenia, the prenatal stage in particular, and th this goes back to it. That particular marks, a particular functional aspects of the fetal brain seem to be most enriched 
for the heritable component of schizophrenia. Yeah? Early development, early stages. And that's what we try to use in our own data too, in our own uh, work. Um, so here, I'd like to give you two examples now um, uh, of, of, of our work. The first is done by Anil. Anil is, uh, uh, is working towards his PhD in, in my group. And we, you can imagine that we are part of this large consortia with, with hundreds and thousands of samples involved. And our cohort is important, but it's just a tiny stone, a little brick in the, in the wall that, that we are building together. And so we can sit still and wait as a group what we do, but it, it, we also want to do our own work and con contribute in meaningful ways. Uh, but we cannot do it with 100,000 samples. Uh, we can do it with the data that is coming from it, but we also have, want to develop our own uh, uh, models and thoughts and, and, and new insights. But Anil asked the question, is there a way that we can go from these large GWAS studies, the genome-wide association studies, to a model system in the lab that we can really tweak something and look into functional aspects of the biology that is represented there. And if you think about a model system, it needs to recapitulate the time and space that is important for the disease, but also the genetic contribution. And that's something that he investigated here in this case. So is the in vivo context of the disease represented in the cells that we have? And is the genetic risk also enriched for what we're looking at? Because if it's not, why bother? And so he, he prepared this, this overview here. He says, okay, we have this model system of human neuronal cells, or progenitor cells that are developed in neuronal cells, and let's follow it and for 30 days and see what happens. So we have the model system, and the way we assay it is by gene expression. We look at what genes are expressed over a period, time period of 30 days. The second component is that we look into the functional aspects. Does it represent early development of the fetal brain? Yeah? That's what we saw before uh, through the genetic studies. And then do we identify pathways within that framework? And are these pathways that we identify then enriched for genetic signal? So those are the steps that he undertook. Yeah? Model system, functional characterization, pathways, genetic enrichment. So the first thing, so we took the 30 days, zero, day two, day five, 10, 15, 20, and 30. And for each of these days, we had multiple um, 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 cells growing, and we took these assays and uh, took these cells and collected the, the gene expression data. And you can see that if you, if you do a principal component analysis, there's a misspelling error there. Um, principal component analysis, you can see that each of the samples clustered very nicely together. Yeah. And it uh, means that if we, we have good duplicates or replicate samples there. They behave the same way. But also the day zero is not mixed with day 30. So the features of the genes that are expressed distinguish day zero from day 30 or day zero from day two and so forth. And if you then ask the question, what kinds of genes are expressed? And if we only take the genes that are known to be neuronal and compare it to genes that are uh, um, uh, typical for astrocytes or, or microglia, we can also separate those two very clearly here and say, over time, you see an increase of features that are neuronal and a, and a decrease of all the other types of cells, of brain type cells that we, uh, that we uh, selected against. Of course, the cells are growing and we add some growth factor to it in order to make neuronal cells. That's our purpose. But according to this identity test, it's, it's behaving well. The other question then is, if it's behaving well as neuronal cells, does it also mimic the in vivo features? And then Geschwind here has developed some tools a few years ago in which he took different stages of fetal brain and cortical layers and then said, uh, these are the genes that are expressed. And so we compared that information, that data, with our own information of these neuronal cells. And um, without going into the details here, we, when we compare day zero to five, our own experiment, it all goes back to the early stages uh, of prenatal development that he had uh, recorded in his fetal brains at that time. And the same is true for day five to 15. You see a slight shift there, and also day 15 to day 30, there's a slight shift, but it still represents a prenatal developmental uh, uh, features um, based on the data that we uh, generate. Uh, explain what the purpose of the model was. No, the, the, the purpose is that we, um, generate something in the lab 
that represents the early the fetal brain development and that we can identify biology or pathways that are enriched with genetic signal relevant for disease. Because once we establish that, we can tweak it and see what the impact is, what, what the consequence is, and see hey, if someone, uh, if a particular variant is there, how does it change um, the feature of this early neurodevelopment, and why does it cause risk for schizophrenia? And so it's really the basic questions that we try to answer here before we move on to just using the model. And here it shows that it's not just an, an and cell types, uh, that is uh, what we, what we look, are looking for, but also the in vivo circumstances that mimic neurodevelopment. That's important for us. No? So here we're back again. We looked at the model system, we collected the data, and when we look at the cellular identity and also did an in vitro in vivo comparison, we, we can say it's neuronal and it mimics early fetal uh, neurodevelopment. Yeah? That's important. So now we go to the biological pathways and the disease enrichment. Is it relevant or not? And so what, what Anil did, he said, okay, if genes are constantly expressed throughout those 30 days, are they important? Maybe. But most of the variation, most of the information will be tagged by changes in gene expression. If something goes up in time, you would think it has a particular function during the process of development. So let's look at what we call the non-constant genes during those 30 days. So you have to, we use tools to identify those. We use two different tools because uh, each tool has its own um, uh, pluses and minuses. And so we end up with some 5,000 or 6,000 uh, or 7,000 it is um, uh, transcripts that were changing at some level, detectable level during those 30 days. And then we ask the question, if we look at those 7,000, what does it tell us? Do we see patterns? Because you can imagine that some genes are increased in expression, but others are decreased in expression. Some are going up and down again, and each of them have a, has, may have a different function. And so what Anil did is he said, okay, I can identify clusters. I can, uh, for example, identify a cluster of genes, that, these are all the genes uh, fulfilling that criteria, that goes up in time, over the 30 days. These are not all 7,000, there may be 600 or 400 genes that are changing like this over time, fulfilling this criteria. And when you look at the identity of these genes and do some sort of a pathway analysis, you can say, oh, wait a minute, these are genes known to be involved in synapse and vesicles and neuron differentiation, according to the literature. That is interesting, it fits what we expect. And so we call this, uh, cluster, a neuronal growth cluster. Yeah? This is one example. And we identified um, 10 clusters, I think, it was, or eight in total here, six, eight. And you could, this cluster here of things that go down, uh, gene expression goes down, is cell cycle. You can imagine it. A cell cycle means there is cell growth. It's very generic. It's not unique to neuronal cells, even though it's important for neuronal cells to grow. But at some point, they don't grow as fast anymore, so then the cell cycle stops, more or less. RNA processing, these three clusters uh, represent together synaptic type of function. And here, these are other extracellular matrix, for example. So we could identify a different function based on the genes that have different pathways. And all these clusters were identified through a uh, data-driven approach. We didn't say, we want this and this and this. No, we said, let the data tell us what kind of clusters we can identify based on the gene expression. And then you can ask the question, um, for each of the clusters of the, all the genes that are differentially expressed, is there an enriched genetic signal for disease? And not just the disease of your interest, but also other diseases to see how it behaves. We use some, and I, we will, won't really go into detail here, but we primarily use MAGMA that I, uh, I'll show you. It's a gene set analysis. You just take the genes that are part of your cluster and you say what SNPs or what variants are represented there, and are these variants explaining some of the heritability of the disease based on the GWAS? So you take the, 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 the consortium data and you map it back onto your data of gene expression and see if you can explain anything. So we took schizophrenia, we took major depression, bipolar, ADHD, uh, autism, but also Alzheimer's and human height as controls. Because Alzheimer's, for example, is a brain disease, but it's late onset, it's neurodegeneration, which is quite different from neurodevelopment. 
we do not expect that neurodegeneration has sa the same function as neurodevelopment. So when you look at then the enrichment signal, it is primarily what we observe here in schizophrenia. Yeah. Those are the genes, the overall differentially expressed genes. Yeah. So here we have evidence from, yeah, it's not just neuronal representing in vivo, we can see pathways, but it's also a genetic uh, enrichment. And when you go to the subcategories of, 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 of uh, clusters here, we can see that the enrichment, these are sig significantly enriched here, is particularly in the synaptic uh, function uh, um, categories that's increased here. Also somewhat here, but it's depleted here and here. And for Alzheimer's, there's nothing visible, nothing. Yeah? So now we can, if we tweak this particular domain or the, uh, the cluster of genes, if we are able to do so, we can say neuronal growth, how does it impact, we know there's genetic enrichment, how does it impact the other things and the, uh, the functional elements or the functional features of these cells. So overall, if I would summarize this, uh, these steps that Anil undertook is, it shows that there is indeed an in vitro system that we can apply in the lab and, and modulate and, and play with uh, that, that represents the in vivo context of the disease. Is it perfect? No, absolutely not. Yeah? But it at least represents to some extent part of the disease that we can work with and uh, control. And um, it, it, it represents not just an in vivo context of the disease, but also a genetic context that's important for us. Yeah? And so um, now uh, we hope that we can just use this longitudinal data to change things and s develop other uh, brain cells, glial cells, uh, for example, and see if we find similar features or different. And also see if, for example, uh, the genetic signal of bipolar is uh, correlated to the genetic signal of schizophrenia in these different cell types. Of is, is there a distinction after all? Yeah. Okay. Last few minutes, another example that I'd like to share with you. And it's work by, uh, by Luz, but also by Sergei. Luz is in my lab, a postdoc, and Sergei is with Eliezer. Maybe he has talked ab about some of his work here already. Oh, the ROP, did he? Oh, this is related. Okay, this relates to the ROP stuff, yeah? Because what we did at some point in time is we had gene expression data from patients. And not just patients from schizophrenia, but also bipolar. And we also have some, an ALS project. ALS is a neurodegenerative disorder. And he was, uh, was a pilot at that stage. But we just asked the question, do we find microbial, do we find evidence of transcripts of microbial origin in human blood? Well, honestly, the literature is very sparse on it. But blood was thought to be ster sterile. Uh, when there's no sepsis, when everything is clean. So people did not expect microbial transcripts to be present in blood. Yeah. Um, but lo and behold, um, when we looked in these different groups here, in controls, in schizophrenia, bipolar, and ALS, we were able to detect um, these transcripts that surprised us. And I'll show you a little bit how we got there. First of all, we just took blood. Yeah. And then you can do RNA sequence. And then uh, you get all these reads there. And um, um, then you can map it back to the human uh, genome. And then ordinarily, the unmapped reads go in the waste bin. And that's what Sergei talked about. Um, he leveraged that unmapped, those unmapped reads to see what's in there. But, but when we investigate the unmapped reads, the, map, the reads that don't go back to the human genome, we identified that they're mapping back to microbial sequences that are known. Yeah. And so suddenly, we have a blood micro, uh, microbiome profile using RNA sequencing data in our samples. Is it abundant? No, it's really sparse. Yeah. It's really sparse. Uh, a small percentage of the reads that really uh, represents the micro microbial uh, sequences. So. Um, uh, we don't know where it's coming from, but it's there. So we asked them the question, how can we investigate this? Because we have these sequences, we can map it back to known reference panels, but is there a way to categorize it more, more, more systematically? So there are some programs out there, one of them is Philosift, that puts sequences back into a, uh, into a um, 
overview of different known and um, uh, sequences from species, microbial species, or phyla in this case. And even though your sequence is not identical, it just maps it where the closest relative is you know, of the sequence. So it gets an you get an overview of the type of phyla that you may have, or sometimes it's not exact, but sometimes it is more the, the closest relative that's represented. But we observe those in our data. And this is a summary of, that, of our observations of the unmapped reads. We have the bipolar group, the controls, the ALS, and the schizophrenia. And we identified 23 phyla, the reads here. And for some of them, it was present in one fourth of the sample. But it's all the samples are represented here. You can already see here some differences. I'm not sure you, you, your eye, eyes catch it. But you can see that this group has more color or less green or blue, what color is that? And that's what we observed too. So even though we did not expect anything here in particular, we did not investigate schizophrenia for schizophrenia's sake, it was just a measure of do we see microbial sequences? We were surprised to say yes, but then we find more, it seems, in schizophrenia. One of the biggest problems that we face here is that it may be contamination. Because it's, only, it's so sparse, there's only a few reads that you really detect. And you can imagine that there are all sorts of uh, contamination. First of all, we did not collect this blood under sterile uh, circumstances thinking about microbial sequences at all. Uh, a needle goes through the skin, so maybe it's just representing a skin. It's possible. Uh, maybe it's something in the core facility that happens and that added some nose drops of an, of an technician in your sample and uh, there's all sorts of reasons you can imagine. So we really uh, made great effort to look at uh, the uh, negative and positive controls to see how specific the signal was. Um, we looked at other cell types, negative experiments. We, do, looked at, we did some positive controls. Uh, we considered skin contamination. We realized afterwards, oh, wait a minute, we always have true blood tubes. The f and maybe the first is contaminated with skin because the, the needle goes in, and there may be a little bit of piece of tissue there that goes in, in the tube. But we have an A and B tube that we use for RNA, and we just randomize it. And, so, and we see it in everything. It's not that only an A and only B is there. We don't even know A and B, which one, which one came first. It's only labeled afterwards. So that is, cannot, it cannot be. Some technical and experimental confounders. So everything that we tested, we were only more convinced that the data is true. And then we looked at the differences more formally, because I showed you the picture. It seemed that schizophrenia is slightly different. But when you look at the diversity, you can uh, define an alpha diversity and compare the different groups here. You can see that in schizophrenia, the diversity of the, um, of the different taxa is increased in schizophrenia compared to all the other categories. Yeah. Is it a lot? Well, yeah, it is to some degree. It, is, um, um, it explains a couple percentage of the variance of the disease, and it is, in this case, more than we expected. The group sizes are not that big, but it's clearly uh, distinguishable there. And these, these differences um, are not based on any of the variants that we could explain. We corrected for everything possible, and it's, it remains significant. So, and as I said here, it, it explains 5% of the variance according to this, which is uh, relatively a lot, I think. Um, and if we go at the different levels, not just the phyla, but also the class, the order, the family, and genus, this observation remains significant. Huh? And so it seems to be very robust. But you can imagine that Maybe it's just a schizophrenia patient have a particular micro microbial phyla that is really making a big difference here. Well, we could not find any evidence for that. So also when you compare the diversity within each group, so within controls here, with, between schizophrenia and controls, and within the, in, uh, between schizophrenia patients, it's basically the same. It suggests it's an overall diversity that is really different. The, the level, the overall diversity is likely not due to specific profile in schizophrenia. Um, so let's get to a close here. We try to um, look at the individual uh, microbial uh, phyla. We saw two that were slightly overrepresented in schizophrenia. Yeah, significant, but in our paper we try not to emphasize it too much. 
because I'm wor I cannot really guarantee this is true. And uh, I'm just worried that this may be a takeaway for the popular press to say, oh, wait a minute, the plankton mycetes are linked to chlamydia, and chlamydia infections are, have been reported in the past to be uh, linked to schizophrenia. We don't know that. It's really too early to say it. And uh, our sample size is relatively small, too. It's relevant, of course, to replicate this finding. So we did that in another sample that we had, and we were able to confirm the increased diversity uh, in a totally independent sample. It's so independent that even the type of RNA that we sequence is different. This is total RNA. This is poorly A selected RNA. It's, quite, it's, it's different in nature. And still we were able to detect it there. It's quite strong evidence, I think. But what does it mean? What does it mean that we find an increased microbi uh, microbial diversity in schizophrenia? Is it um, just a representation of the immune system that's activated? Is it um, something else that is controlling it? We don't know. The f simply the fact that it's not found in bipolar, while we know that the genetic risk for bipolar is 70% correlated with schizophrenia, suggests to me that it's not, that is independent of the genetic risk. It may be secondary to disease even. And if you wonder about it, schizophrenia patients are often found on streets and circumstances that are not overly clean. Yeah? Their lifestyle is different. So it may be that what we observe here is representative of that impact that it has on lifestyle rather than disease causing. Even though you can imagine that, that it may have, may have secondary uh, effects uh, nevertheless. We looked at, um, at some uh, correlations with known immune components. We, used, uh, we were able to reconstruct cell types uh, or cell counts in some individuals and controls in particular for which we had DNA methylation data. It's an indirect way of looking at the immune response, but we could see that the diversity is negatively correlated with uh, differentiated T cells, which suggests that it has to do with an Im immune response, a decreased immune response, possibly. We don't know. Yeah. And I would also not um, 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 exclude I said also that it may be secondary to the disease. It may be that these microbes are present in the gut, but that the gut blood barrier is leaky, whereby some transcripts of some cells end up in the, in the blood. And that's what we did uh, detect. I don't know. It may be. So there's a lot of answers, unanswered questions here that we need to address. And, um, uh, and that's something that we pursue uh, further at this time. Yeah? So if I summarize the overall thing now, what we have seen um, today, psychiatric disorders are highly heritable traits, or also highly polygenic traits. And the, these genome-wide association studies are identifying locus after locus. Uh, it's an oiled machine. It produces what it ought to be. Is it exciting? Well, it was exciting in the beginning. Now it's just doing it. Huh? And, but it is necessary to identify the most important genes or the tar potential targets so that patients can be treated ultimately. When we look at the modeling, uh, trying to model the, uh, the early developmental stages of um, fetal brain development, we, are a we have shown here that it, it mimics to some degree uh, the in vitro and vitro, in vitro and vivo um, system that we want to model and have also shown that there are pathways, particular synaptic pathways in these cells that are enriched for genetic signal of, uh, of uh, schizophrenia risk. And the last thing that we talked about was that patients, schizophrenia patients, seem to have an increased microbial diversity in blood, even though we don't know what the origin is, and it seems not to be connected to a genetic risk per se, and so the further work is needed to, uh, to investigate that. And so the field is moving ahead. Yeah? As a consortium, we're moving ahead, increased sample size. There's also a huge effort in a way to sequence the, the exome, the coding part, but also the whole genome. Those are big efforts on the way. The GWAS is common alleles. Sequencing will also reveal rare alleles that are not detected by array technology. Um, there's an improvement of statistical tools to better understand the signal that we detect thus far and to s better able to correlate uh, uh, different psychiatric traits, but also to understand biology. It's really important. We have these genetic findings, statistics, p-values, great, but what does it mean biologically speaking? And 
e eventually, I hope, it's, uh, disease prediction and treatment is something that's on the horizon. And uh, at other moments, I've also said that I hope that the genetic findings are not just findings that enjoy us, and, but also have a, a benefit for society in general, that the stigma that is, uh, uh, that is there for illnesses, the mental illness in particular, uh, is taken away because people ought to recognize that these are biological phenomena uh, that we are dealing with. <laughs> Questions? You mentioned the functional groups of the significant disease schizophrenia, and there were most of them in CNS. Yeah. Um, but then there were also some in immune, and I think the third one was adrenal, but I don't quite remember. So has that been looked into? Because the immune was looked into with like the microbiome. Yeah. The, um, the, enrich the, the significance for the enrichment is not sufficient to call it today and say, yes, let's investigate that further. Uh, for the central nervous system, it's really obvious and it's really powerful. But uh, I think the evidence for the other uh, cell types and, and, and systems, um, um, I will not put my, my, my money there, uh, even though this is a hint of enrichment there. We just, I said, finished the bipolar schizophrenia combined analysis, and our hope was that for bipolar, for example, that some of the genetic risk would not be central nervous system, but more in the hormonal um, uh, regulation or so other um, uh, uh, other system. But when we looked at the genetic data, we could not separate those two, and so we're really pushing ahead. It is possible that there's still a non central nervous system component that contributes to one of these diseases. But maybe we don't have sufficient power yet to detect it. And that's another thing to increase the sample sizes that we are better able to tease apart, or take apart the, the biological signal that is represented by the by the genetics. What was the reason uh, we started looking into the microbiomes in the blood? You know, people asked that, and it's also uh, reviewers have also. Uh, um, dinged us for that. So why are you looking at this? Why these three groups? Um, first of all, we collected the RNA-seq data in the early stage just to make sure that we know how to work with RNA sequencing data. So a, few, a couple of years ago, five years ago, so a little bit longer. And then um, it's also clear that 48 for each group is not really uh, large enough to detect huge effects. Uh, each of the brain diseases is, is not really detectable uh, or changes are not detectable in blood. So we had the data, and one afternoon, I just, I'm not sure why I did it, I looked at some non-human sequences, uh, and, and, I didn't, and said, wait a minute, I, s it, I see some, some signal of, of other species there. And then we got to talk to, to Eliezer and others, and said, wait a minute, we should have a more comprehensive approach here. Um, and we did not know what to expect. Um, I did not expect something different in bipolar and schizophrenia or ALS. Uh, it just happened to be that way. And you can imagine that oftentimes in science, these discoveries are coincidental. You just look at the data in a different way, and it happens to be uh, uh, contain a signal unexpectedly. Some of the microbes you found in the only thing you found Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. Uh, are some of the uh, microbiomes that you found, uh, are they known to no, we no. That's a good. That's a good question. Um, we, we don't know. I'm really thinking hard about uh, the blood, brain, and gut connection um, because we have some other studies too, in which we look at the the CNS and the cerebral spinal fluid, which is the brain fluid, and in the hope that when we measure metabolites in the CSF, in the blood, and in the gut, that you may find connections because. Serotonin is one of those uh, neurometabolites, or ne ne neurotransmitters, that's mostly generated in the gut and not elsewhere in the body. And we also know that serotonin is important for behavior and, and behavioral uh, traits. And so there absolutely is a connection between the gut and the brain. And this may be just a first step to, toward that. I, I, we don't know, but it, it's certainly a connection that we should not ignore. Uh, excellent point. <laughs> 